I also want to view the human security issue uh, more broadly than the uh, seven pillars to include uh, security from war uh, and security from violence. Because for me, human security means the chance to stay alive and to thrive. And yet we're uh, absolutely uh, under the uh, very, very dark cloud of nuclear war as a real possibility right now, more than at any time in, uh, in decades, actually. Um, and we have a raging hot war that people have extremely different views about where it came from, what it signifies, and how to end it. And so I view human security in an even broader context <laughs> And I think we should uh, really reflect on that broad context. What, what this is, is the timeline for what's called the doomsday clock. Uh, I'll start with a very cheery subject. Um, in 1947, uh, just after the uh, start of the atomic age with the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the atomic scientists who uh, in many cases had contributed to the science that brought about atomic weapons instituted what they called a doomsday clock and they made the metaphor of minutes to midnight uh, how close are we to midnight meaning self-realized doom and this clock is uh, maintained by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists to this day. So we are uh, 75 years of this clock, actually 76 years. And two years after uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the scientists put the clock at seven minutes to midnight in 1947. Uh, then the arms race picked up with uh, the Soviet Union uh, exploding a, uh, an atomic bomb, uh, showing that now there were two countries with atomic bombs. Uh, and in 1949, we went to about three minutes to midnight. And then in 1953, uh, we entered the age of the hydrogen bomb, the thermonuclear uh, fusion bomb, uh, vastly more powerful than the uh, fission bombs uh, and we went to two minutes to midnight and remained at two minutes to midnight until 1960 uh, and then there seemed uh, possibly some thaw though it was short-lived because we had the Cuban Missile Crisis 61 years ago in October but then brilliantly President Kennedy and Chairman Khrushchev uh, negotiated a peaceful resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and in the following year negotiated the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And the hands of the clock was pushed all the way back to 12 minutes away from midnight. In other words, stepping back from the brink of destruction. And you can see that the clock has gone uh, in uh, waves uh, during the mid-1980s when Ronald Reagan uh, assumed the presidency. Uh, it reached, uh, again, about three minutes to midnight with the U.S. placement of uh, intermediate-range nuclear weapons in Europe. And then Mikhail Gorbachev came to power, and he was the greatest uh, man of peace in our age. Uh, he unilaterally disbanded the Soviet military alliance, the Warsaw Pact, and you can see that the clock went up to 17 minutes away from midnight, the highest that it was ever, uh, um, meaning the farthest away from disaster. That was Gorbachev's contribution in 19. 91. So all of that step from 1985 to 1991 uh, was uh, the work of uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. 
But uh, the point I would make is that from 1991 onward, <laughs> at the end of the Cold War, when we have the chance to really achieve security, what do we do? We completely squander over a 30 year period, every hope that existed in 1991. And it's just a steady decline from 1991 until where we are today in 2023 at just one and a half minutes to midnight, the closest to complete disaster ever recorded in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. So we're much richer than we were in 1947. We have many more gadgets, many more tools. We have fantastic technology and we're closer to blowing ourselves up and wrecking the planet environmentally than ever before. 60 years ago this week, President Kennedy gave the finest speech ever given by a modern American president in his uh, so-called peace speech, where he said, we can achieve peace uh, if we believe in it and if we understand that our adversaries also want peace. So in that remarkable speech that he gave on June 10, 1963, he called on Americans to reassess their view of the Cold War. Quite incredible. He didn't demand the Soviet Union do things. He said the United States had to reassess its understanding. And the American people needed to understand that the Soviet people, or the Russians, were full of valor, full of virtue, with great achievements in science and the arts uh, and in culture and bravery. And so he told the American people how virtuous the Russian people were and how we should make peace with them because they wanted the same thing that the Americans want. And after that speech, his counterpart, Nikita Khrushchev, declared to the US envoy in Moscow, I want to make peace with your president. That's the finest speech an American president has given since Franklin Roosevelt. So what changed in 1963 wasn't any objective fact. It was the mindset that changed. It was ending the demonization of the Soviet Union and ending the demonization of the Russian people and humanizing the other side, saying they want peace too. I want to quote two of my favorite observations, one by President Kennedy uh, again, and one by uh, Edward Wilson, the late great evolutionary biologist at Harvard. So President Kennedy ex explained in one sentence our true existential reality in modern times. In his inaugural address, he said, the world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hands the ability to end all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. So Kennedy in one sentence explained the paradox of modernity that our technologies are so powerful, we could end poverty if that's our mindset, or we could end human life if that is our approach. And Edward Wilson said something uh, true to his being an evolutionary biologist. Uh, he said, so we have entered the 21st century with our Stone Age emotions, our medieval institutions, and our godlike technologies. Technology is the thing that has run completely beyond the human capacity right now. I would say that there are two very strong examples of this and a third one that is immediate and evident. The first is, of course, atomic uh, technology. You know, the genius to understand that one could create a, a, a nuclear chain reaction and uh, turn that into nuclear energy, 
for bombs or for electricity was such unbelievable genius. There were probably 50 people in the world in uh, the 1930s that truly understood this. Einstein, Niels Bohr, Schillard, uh, very, very few people. These geniuses created something unimaginable and then put it in the hands of dolts because there are lots of people that know how to drop bombs, but only a few people knew how to make it. And so this is the paradox of technology. There are lots of dolts around. Uh, some geniuses create some breakthroughs and then they can be used for good or ill. A more immediate example is biotechnology. The technology to uh, sequence the genome and then to create DNA and really create live viruses from strings of letters, which is uh, what uh, one of our scientists in the United States does for a living, Ralph Barrick at University of North Carolina, most likely a virus that was being experimented on using Barrick's methods at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. We don't know for sure, but we have a lot of reason to believe that that's a pretty realistic scenario. One thing I will tell you about that is there, again, are 50 or 100 or 200 people that really understand the technology. There are maybe a couple thousand people that know what really happened, and the rest of us are in the dark. Now we have another extremely powerful technology, artificial intelligence, large language models, generative AI. It's being embedded everywhere now. And how many people really understand the technology? Some hundreds. How many people really control what's going on right now? A, a few thousands in a few major tech. We have a serious governance problem. Uh, and the governance is our tools are more powerful than ever in history. They could end all forms of human poverty. <laughs> they can end up destroying everything as well. And those who hold these technologies really understand what Francis Bacon told them in 1605, that knowledge is power. And this knowledge is extraordinarily concentrated. Just a few people understand each of these technologies at their, at their real uh, core, and they control them. Control them for greed, control them for political power, control them for military force. Maybe we could use them even to fight poverty and get children to have an education. That's why we're on the line today. President Kennedy, by the way, in his speech, 60 years ago, went out of his way to say too many people believe that peace is impossible, that peace is unreal, Real. that we are gripped by forces we cannot control. And he said, that is false. Our problems are man-made, therefore they can be solved by man. And so we can solve these issues, but I would suggest that when we focus on human security, we focus on our current insecurity and we focus on the fact that we are not governing ourselves properly to harness the technologies that we have, not for greed, not for surveillance, not to invade our privacy, not to addict us online, not to weaponize and put into our drones, but actually to use for sustainable development.